Well, thank you for inviting me to talk today. I'm very pleased to be able to give an update on COVID-19 and HIV, but also to have the opportunity to look at this through a statistical lens, focusing perhaps on some of the challenges that we're now facing when attempting to assess the impact of HIV on COVID outcomes. Now, I don't need to tell anyone here about the devastating global impact of SARS-CoV-2 infection. I think it's fair to say that a year ago when the first reports of this virus started to appear, none of us had a clear understanding of whether HIV would have an impact on either the risk of infection with SARS-CoV-2 nor the outcomes. And yet, despite this complete lack of evidence, there was an urgent need for guidance on how to support people with HIV, particularly around recommendations for shielding. Over the past year, however, we've been inundated with reports about COVID and its outcomes, with many people feeling immense pressure to report their experiences. Academic journals introduced fast track pr review processes for COVID submissions and manuscript preprints, few of which have been through any formal peer review process, were circulated widely. And I think in some cases this has really hindered rather than supported our progress. So today I'm going to start by summarising some of the key studies that have attempted to describe the outcomes of people with HIV and COVID. It isn't going to be an exhaustive review as I simply don't have the time, but I just want to focus on a few of the larger studies using these to illustrate some of the methodological challenges that we're now facing. So I want to start by thanking Laura Waters for this slide. This was pretty much the state of play last October when Laura presented the slide at the HIV Glasgow meeting. Now she did go on to describe a few more studies in detail, which I will also do. But the point is that this was only three months ago. And at that point, we really had very limited information about the possible interaction between HIV and COVID. Many of the studies, as you'll see on the slide, were extremely small, often without controls and from limited geographical settings. Settings. Now, there had been some other studies. Spanish investigators had collected data from all confirmed COVID diagnoses among people with HIV and ART over the period from February to mid-April. And they reported that the overall age and sex standardized risk of COVID-19 diagnosis among people with HIV over that 75 day period was 30 per 10,000 persons with hospitalization and ICU admission rates of 17.8 and 2.5 per 10,000 persons respectively and a COVID-19 death rate of 3.7 per 10,000 persons. And to put that into context, the authors reported that the equivalent risk of diagnosis in the Spanish general population was 41.7 per 10,000, although this was reduced to 33 per 10,000 once healthcare workers were excluded. And the mortality rate in the general population in Spain was 2.1 per 10,000, suggesting a mortality rate that was almost 80% higher in those with HIV. Now, at the same time in the UK, we'd also been looking at COVID-19 outcomes, firstly through an analysis of the ISERIC data set, which included over 47,000 adults hospitalised with COVID, 122 of whom were HIV positive. And in this analysis, we considered 28-day mortality as the primary outcome. There were several key differences in the characteristics of people with HIV who'd been admitted with COVID and the rest of the population, most notably in terms of the age distribution, which you can see here, uh, people with HIV being almost 20 years younger on average than the HIV negative group. And most importantly, probably only around a third of those with HIV were over the age of 60, but that contrasts to around three quarters of those without HIV. And given what we know about the demographic characteristics of those with HIV in the UK, the HIV group here also included a, a slightly smaller proportion of women, but also higher proportions of people of black and other ethnic minority groups. Now, the groups also differed in their comorbidity history uh, with lower rates of cardiac disease, pulmonary disease, dementia and malignancy in the HIV positive group. And this might seem surprising, given that we know that HIV is associated with an increased risk of those com comorbidities. But of course, we've also got to take into consideration the differing age distributions between the two groups. 
Now this slide shows the Kaplan-Meier curve, so mortality in the two groups at the top. So you can see the blue line here, which uh, relates to the HIV negative group and the red line being the HIV positive group. And overall, what you can see is that blue line is below the red line, suggesting that actually people with HIV had uh, were lower risk of mortality than people without HIV. And we saw a similar pattern when we looked within women here and we looked within men. Um, however, when we subdivided by age, then we started to see a different picture. So particularly in the younger age groups, so this is the a, a group that's under 50 and the group that's age 50 to 59. And in both of those age groups, we could see that the direction of those lines has now reversed. So people with HIV in those age groups actually have worse mortality outcomes than the HIV negative group. In contrast, if you look at the older age group here, you can see that the trends were the same as those in the overall population. And of course, given that this group actually reflects about seven, three quarters of the population, then that's probably not surprising. And this was reflected in the results from the Cox model, which showed that without adjustment, there was no significant difference in the 28 day mortality between those with and without HIV. And adjusting for sex uh, and ethnicity didn't change that at all. But when we included age into the model, then that effect was reversed and became significant, indicating a higher rate of mortality in those with HIV when you compared them to a similarly aged HIV negative group. And at that point, adjusting for other factors in the model really had very little uh, impact on the estimate. Now, there was a second large analysis of COVID-19 outcomes that was being undertaken in the UK at the same time from the Open Safely group. This is a data analytics platform through which you could, they, the authors linked routinely collected data from primary care practices in the UK to national death registration data. Importantly for this analysis, all included adults had been registered with the GP for at least a year prior to the date. The outcome was COVID-19 death, and that was identified through death registration. An HIV status was identified through GP records. And the, this approach provided a huge population-based denominator with almost 18 million records in the analysis, of whom just over 28,000 were identified as being HIV positive. So that's actually over a quarter of those known to be living with HIV in the UK. Now, the results from this analysis were actually very consistent with those from the ESRIC analysis, with no significant difference overall in an unadjusted analysis. But once age and sex were included in the model, you can see that the results suggested that people with HIV had an almost threefold increased mortality risk. And in fact, those results didn't change greatly, whether regardless of the adjustments in the model. In contrast to the ISRIC analysis, the authors did also find an association in both in the younger and the older age groups. But what they also found was that the effects seemed to be strongest in those of black ethnicity and in those with at least one comorbidity. Now, the real benefit of this analysis is the size of the data set that can be analysed, but the major limitation, of course, is that the authors are then dependent on accurate information on HIV status and comorbidities in GP records, and this may be very problematic, particularly in the UK. And neither this nor the ISRIC analysis was able to adjust for several key confounders, including occupation, which is clearly an important risk factor for exposure, or measures of HIV disease stage. Now, not all studies have found an association with HIV infection. This analysis of a large research use network in the US, for example, included over 50,000 people with COVID, of whom just over 400 had HIV infection. In unadjusted analysis, you can see that the risk ratio suggested an increased risk of over 55% uh, for 30-day mortality and an 83% increase in risk for hospitalization amongst those with HIV. Now, instead of using a multivariable regression approach to deal with the confounder adjustment, the authors chose to use a propensity score matching approach. And with this approach, what they found was that the effects of both of these were attenuated, uh, being reduced to a 33% increased risk for mortality and a 70% increased risk for hospitalization. 
Um, this uh, association with mortality, however, wasn't significant. But what I do want to point out is that when you use propensity score matching, because of the methodology, um, you actually effectively discard a lot of the data set and therefore the confidence intervals for these estimates, as you'll see, were really quite wide. And that's probably why they weren't significant. Now, the final data I'm going to show is from the Western Cape province in South Africa. And this is another extremely large data set containing records on around 7 million people, of whom around half a million had HIV infection. And you can see from the findings that amongst the full population in the study, those with HIV had over twofold risk of COVID death compared to those without HIV. But interestingly, when the group subdivided the HIV positive group according to their viral uh, status and their level of immunosuppression, they didn't see any strong evidence of a difference between the association in those different groups. So is there inconsistency between the studies? Uh, and if so, why? Well, firstly, I think it's worth pointing out that overall the studies that have reported associations have tended to be the largest studies and those reported more recently. And clearly HIV is still a relatively rare infection in many settings. And therefore studies do need to be of sufficient size to be able to detect an association. So overall, perhaps there isn't as much inconsistency as we think. I would urge you at this point to read one of the two excellent commentaries that have been written uh, around this topic, which includes a review of the Open Safely study from Laura Waters and Anton Posniak in Lancet HIV, and also commentary from Jeannie Triant in Clinical Infectious Diseases. Both of these discuss some of the limitations of the various analyses that have been published. But beyond this, I think we, there are several analytical challenges that we have to consider, and I've grouped those into those which relate to selection bias, so essentially focusing on the definition of the population, those that relate to confounder adjustment, particularly in terms of the confounders that we can adjust for and those which we should adjust for. And then finally, there are the perils associated with big data, some of which I've already alluded to. So let me start by thinking about the populations that are included in the studies. And you may have noticed that the studies described so far have all included different populations ranging from the general population. So in the Western Cape study, say, those who are registered with a GP, as in the Open Safely study, those who are hospitalized with COVID, as in the ISRIC analysis. But the studies also differ in terms of how COVID itself is de defined and whether that's based on a positive test for SARS-CoV-2 or a clinical event. So with this in mind, it's probably not that surprising that findings may be inconsistent. Now, you could argue that if you're investigating the association with HIV status, then this doesn't matter too much as long as the approaches that are used have been used consistently between those who are HIV positive and those who are negative in a study. But of course, this may not always be the case. So let me try to display this some of, uh, visually. And let me start by assuming that we have a population of people with HIV of which a certain proportion will acquire SARS-CoV-2 infection. Now, there'll also be a certain proportion of the population that will report symptoms that are suggested of COVID-19 infection. But this second group is unlikely to overlap completely with the population with infection because there will be people here with asymptomatic infection. And there's also going to be a group here who are either misdiagnosed or who never tested positive, either because they didn't have a test or because the test was a, a false negative finding. Now, of the group in the middle, uh, a proportion of people with, will be hospitalized. And for simplicity, I'm just going to assume that only those with symptoms are admitted to hospital. And then another proportion of those will be admitted to ICU. So this is all fine. And this is probably what we would expect for any viral infection. But the first difficulty arises because some people will drop out along that pathway. So there will be some people with symptoms who may die without being hospitalized. And there will be some people over here, perhaps, who may uh, have symptoms but, don't, but die without having ever been tested. And these people are therefore going to appear only in analyses that either don't require hospitalization or don't require a confirmed diagnosis, respectively. 
So again, would that matter if if the chance of this was was independent of HIV status, then comparisons with the general population shouldn't really be biased. But of course, if the threshold to test somebody to admit them to hospital or to admit them to ICU is affected by knowledge of their HIV status, then we start to introduce bias. And it would also help, of course, if we knew the proportions in some of these groups, but at this point we don't. And finally, as tests have improved in sensitivity and as the recommendations for testing have changed, you can see that the proportions and type of people who appear in those different populations may well differ. So if you're looking at a study that included people hospitalized last March, say, the results may be very different to the uh, a study of people hospitalized last December. Now that leads me on to the problem of dark data, which sounds like something that statisticians would collect through forays, in, forays into the dark web. Now, in fact, in marketing or informatics fields, this is often a term used to describe information that's routinely collected by organizations, which could provide important information, which is never actually used for any purpose. So essentially it's data that's fallen down a black hole somewhere. But the term has recently been adopted by some statisticians to refer more generally to data that relate to hidden populations that we never see, but without which our conclusions may be incorrect. So for example, we know that a person has to be exposed to SARS-CoV-2 before she or he can be infected. But exposure itself is moderated and modified by advice to shield. And of course, in many settings, those with HIV and particularly those with low CD4 counts were generally advised to shield. So we wouldn't expect to see that many people with low CD4 counts actually becoming infected and becoming sick. So if a study reports no association of a poor outcome with a low CD4 count, do we really believe that this is the case? Or does this simply reflect the fact that there were very few people with low CD4 counts who made it into the data set? Now, what about confounder adjustment? Can we and should we? Well, just as a reminder, when we're investing any association between HIV, say, and a poor outcome, be that COVID infection, serious morbidity or death, we must always consider whether any factors may be confounding the association seen, meaning that the association we're looking at does not reflect the true association between HIV and the outcome. So let's start with age. Can we and should we adjust for that? Well, I think that should be fairly straightforward, particularly from the data I've shown already. Yes, of course we should. But it's surprising how often even this simple adjustment doesn't happen. And as proof, here's a recent meta-analysis that's looked at the role of several concurrent infections, including HIV, on the clinical outcomes of COVID. And here's the figure that was shown and the results from the meta-analysis for HIV. And you can look at the estimates that were used in that, and it is clear from these that these are the unadjusted estimates. But I've already shown you that the conclusions um, can differ very greatly depending on whether you do or don't adjust for age. Now, the main conclusion of this meta-analysis was that the clinical outcomes of COVID in those with HIV were comparable to those without HIV, clearly misleading and a potentially very dangerous conclusion. What about gender? Well, again, this is probably both straightforward to do and certainly should be adjusted for. But what about ethnicity? Now, this is where things start to get a little difficult. Not only may this not be possible in some countries where the collection of data on ethnicity is prohibited, but we must also recognize that ethnicity is almost certainly a proxy for differences in other socioeconomic factors, including occupation and socioeconomic status. And therefore we have to interpret any findings around this very carefully. Occupation, I've already mentioned that there is a potential confounder in many analyses due to the association of occupation with exposure. But realistically, this is one factor that most studies would struggle with because the collection of data on occupation is fraught with difficulties. And then finally, what about comorbidities? Well, this is actually more challenging, not only because of the difficulties in collecting unbiased data on these, but also because of the role that some comorbidities may well lie on that causal pathway between HIV and the poor outcomes. And so in fact, the picture would actually look more like this. And if this was the case, then actually, if we adjust for comorbidities here, we would actually be removing some of the effect of HIV that we're actually hoping to detect. And the 
estimate we get will be a biased estimate and it will be an underestimate. So we have to be careful with this type of analysis. And I would ideally suggest that we conduct some sensitivity analysis, which do and don't adjust for these. So finally, what about the perils of big data? Well, I've already alluded to some of these in relation to the Open Safely data set, but I think it's worth reiterating some, particularly when the analysis requires access to sensitive data, which may not always be shared or available. So for example, we know in the UK that whilst most people with HIV are registered with a GP, a substantial number haven't disclosed their HIV status. And those that have tend to be those where there's perceived to be a genuine need for the GP to have this information. So, for example, where serious comorbidities are present or where there might be a concern around drug-drug interactions with prescribed medications. Now, whilst the incorrect inclusion, say, of a thousand people with HIV into a data set of 17 million apparently HIV negative people is unlikely to change the outcomes for that group, the con correct inclusion of that group into the HIV positive group, which will be a much smaller group, might change the association scene. And particularly if the group that you're moving from the HIV negative to the HIV positive group had a fairly benign outcome of COVID. So it is possible that the misclassification could result in some substantial bias. So do I think that HIV is associated with poorer COVID outcomes? Probably yes. But do I think that these poorer outcomes are directly due to HIV infection? Well, possibly not, or there may be a combination of the two. It may simply be that HIV is a marker for a group of people that, on average, has many other risk factors for infection or poor outcomes. The literature hasn't helped by the inclusion of many studies that are clearly small and underpowered, and where the analyses haven't been appropriately conducted. But it is important because this has a huge impact on the way that people with HIV are managed clinically. And looking to the future, I also want to flag up two areas where I think we're going to experience similar analytical challenges. Firstly, when we think about the longer term outcomes of COVID-19 in people with HIV, particularly when many of the reported symptoms of so-called long COVID overlap very closely with the symptoms in ageing cohorts of people with HIV. And secondly, when thinking about the impact of COVID itself or health systems responses to this on HIV outcomes, both are, I believe, going to be extremely difficult subjects to study robustly. So I'm going to stop there and I want to thank you for listening. I'm going to end with a picture of our great English countryside from Kew Gardens, really to remind us all that there are still a lot of positive things in the world, even though it may feel very bleak at this particular point in time. Thank you very much.